So good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today uh, to talk with you about infrared microscopy and nanoscopy with synchrotron radiation. My name is Visa Vaccari. I'm the responsible of the CC beam line, that is the infrared beam line at the Electro Synchrotron at Trieste. In the today um, lesson, I want to talk with you about some basic concepts of infrared spectroscopy, but especially I want to focus on uh, infrared from synchrotron radiation. So I will provide to you a brief history of the infrared spectroscopy at synchrotron radiation facilities worldwide, and um, I will focus on infrared synchrotron radiation generation and properties. Uh, then uh, I want to uh, conclude, I would say, the second part of this presentation by presenting to you the basic concepts of infrared microspectroscopy and especially I will do through uh, two examples and one that uses conventional infrared synchrotron radiation microscopy and especially dedicated to the study of soft X-ray radiation damage produced on biological samples. And then I will uh, give you a flavor of the last advances in infrared um, tools and techniques and especially for vibrational spectroscopy and the nanoscale. So, infrared spectroscopy basic concepts. Uh, we are talking today about infrared light. Infrared light is a very broad region that extends from visible to the microwaves. So that means that in electron volts, the energies involved are of one EV up to some milli electron volts. This reflects a very uh, broad region in terms of wavelengths, so spanning from hundreds of nanometers to hundreds of micrometers or even millimeters. Energies and wavelengths involved in this region are most of the time not sufficient in order to uh, excite electronic transition. Conversely, the range of energies that is uh, in, the midi in the infrared regime uh, is uh, adequate, is useful in order to promote vibrational transition and also rotational ones. So that means that the infrared interaction with matter can be exploited for studying molecular vibrations. Just to remember to use some basic concepts about infrared spectroscopy and the theory of vibration. Um, I want to remember that in case of a diatomic molecule, the best model that can be used for describing a vibration is the quantum mechanical model of an anharmonic oscillator. Solving the Schrodinger equation and considering an anharmonic potential like in the form of the Morse potential in these slides, uh, we end up with the discrete energies, uh, vibrational energies that uh, are spaced in such a way that those levels, uh, the space between these levels is becoming smaller and smaller, increasing the vibrational quantum number. Um, if we consider the selection rules, uh, we know that, uh, I would say, in order uh, to be a load, a transition or vibration uh, should imply variation of the dipole, dipole momentum of the molecule along the direction of vibration. So this is the reason because, for example, homonuclear diatomic molecules are not active in the infrared regime. And the other uh, important selection rules is that the variation of the quantum number should be an integer. So that means that we can observe vibrational transition from the fundamental vibrational state characterized by quantum number equal to zero to the first level of vibration. This is called fundamental frequency, but we can also observe transition from the fundamental uh, level to the level, second level or third level and so on. And this kind of transition, they are called overtones. So the scheme of the design, it's uh, pretty simple for diatomic molecules, but obviously the scenario becomes more and more complicated when the molecules becomes larger. So if we have a molecule constituted by N atoms, um, actually we do not talk about a single vibration, but we talk about normal modes of vibration. And these normal modes can be in number of 3N minus 6 or 3N minus 5 for a linear molecule. So we can imagine that for large molecules we can have a huge number of normal modes of vibration. So, and today we will focus mostly 
on this part of the infrared range that is called mid-infrared regime, where basically we can observe fundamental vibrations or fundamental frequencies. So what we can understand for the infrared spectrum of a system? Actually, we have information that can be retrieved by peak intensity, position and peak width. For example, we should remember that infrared spectroscopy is an absorption spectroscopy. That means that the Lambert and Beer law can be applied for infrared spectroscopy and intensity of the peaks is basically proportional to the concentration of the species that are vibrating. That also implies that we can use this kind of technique for quantitative and semi-quantitative analysis of simple and even complex mixtures. Then we have also uh, information that can be retrieved from peak position and peak width. Basically, we have to remember that the frequency of vibration uh, is proportional to the strength of the bond that uh, um, between two, uh, two or more uh, atoms. Uh, it is inversely, inversely proportional to the reduced mass of the system. That means that from the position of a specific band, we can have information on the atoms involved in the vibration so we can recognize which are the functional groups of the molecules but we can also have information about bond strength, length and conformation that uh, all of them uh, change the value of the strength of the bond between the atoms. But we can also obtain information on the chemical environment where the molecule is. Why? Because changing basically the, the solvent, it will change the in electrostatic interaction or as, as well between the molecule and the solvent and consequently the dipole momentum of the system will change and it will change also the variation of the dipole momentum as a consequence of the, of the vibration. That means that shifts in bands can give us information on the environment where the molecule is. We also have to remember that uh, in, the mid -infrared, in the infrared regime we can also obtain information uh, on the rotation of the molecules, but this is actually something that we can see in the region at lower energy of the infrared, that means in the far infrared regime, and we can have also information on overtone bands, but that kind of information are in the near infrared regime. However, the most important, I would say, characteristics of infrared is that the ensemble of the peaks present in a spectrum can give us information on the entire nature of the molecules, not only related to a single functional group, but all the functional groups that characterize the molecule itself. So most of the time infrared is used for having information on the nature of the molecule or basically on molecular identification. So, Consequently, you can have also information on sample interaction, sample evolution, and so on. And we will try to do you, uh, some, give you some examples, examples in the future slides. Before this part, I wanted to introduce you infrared spectroscopy and especially infrared spectroscopy synchrotron radiation facilities. So, uh, I want to present here for you I would say this paper that is, uh, I would say, the first paper at page one and in the first volume and first number of the physical review, and it is dated 1893. So the title of this paper is A Study of the Transmission Spectra of Certain Substances in the Infrared. So if you have a look at this paper, uh, or even to the abstract, you can understand that infrared spectroscopy was well known also in the 80s. And um, so it is a very, very old technique. However, uh, it became popular only in the 1950s, 1960s. And the reason for this is because there, <clears throat> there, were, there was at that time uh, a very big revolution for what is concerned computer and calculation capacities basically of, um, of, the, of uh, computing on the system, of the computing. So uh, the system became able to solve Fourier transformation and uh, we moved from the past dispersive spectrometers to Fourier transform interferometers that are much, much faster. So this is the reason why uh, in many laboratories, especially chemical labs, infrared spectroscopy became a very popular popular technique for chemical identification. So, 
the history of infrared and synchrotron facility um, start even later with respect to the 50s. And uh, the first uh, paper that has been published on infrared synchrotron radiation emission is dated 1976 and only in uh, um, in the 86, the first beam line was opened in Japan and the ring that is called Ubisoft. And then from that time on, several other facilities, especially in Brookhaven, USA, but also in, in, in Europe, like in France, in Sweden, and in, in German, in uh, UK, became <coughs> started to open to users. In, uh, in Electra, this facility of infrared has been opened in 2006. And the name of the beam line is called CC. Sometimes I, uh, I like to tell that the, the story of the infrared beam lines is a certain, is a Cinderella story because we are, the, I would say, the last beam lines that has been hosted in third generation synchrotron facilities. Nowadays, all new synchrotrons uh, host an infrared beam line from the beginning of the operation and basically all the third generation uh, synchrotron that has been built in the past without infrared beam lines has been upgraded with infrared beams beam lines. So nowadays we have more than 40 infrared synchrotron radiation beam lines worldwide. So basically in each one of more than one in each synchrotron operate in operation. So why the reason to be so late with respect for, for example, uh, to X-ray techniques, uh, even if the technology for infrared is dated much earlier, much in advance with respect to technologies for X-rays. So, the reason for this is because the advantage of infrared synchrotron radiation is not so straightforward as in the case of X-rays. So, <clears throat> for understanding this, this uh, sentence, one should consider generation properties uh, of infrared synchrotron radiation. I would say infrared synchrotron radiation is emitted uh, by bending magnets. So why by bending magnets? Because uh, as I told you, infrared synchrotron radiation is a very, very large um, uh, spectral region. And uh, in order to get useful information for, uh, for a molecule, we need to span, we need to cover many, many wave numbers. So we see thousand wave numbers. So that means that we need a, a sort of white source of the infrared. We cannot be limited by monochromatic source. So uh, bending magnets are the natural source for infrared in synchrotron facilities. The first, um, I would say, uh, theoretical examination of the infrared synchrotron radiation property has been proposed by Duke and Williams in the 80s in a paper that is really famous. So actually, uh, the, the Schwinger equation that I use for, I would say, designing or defining the properties of X-rays from synchrotron emission uh, is also used for infrared, but using obviously different approximation. In any case, if we have a look at the number of photons, so the flux of the source, I would say we see that this, the power of the flux is proportional to the intensity of the current of our ring. It is proportional to the radius <coughs> of our bending magnet, inversely proportional to the wavelength for a given, I would say, horizontal extraction angle and a certain bandwidth. So if we try, if we try to fit in this formula classical parameters that can be, um, you know, in, in the synchrotrons, we can, you can see in this graph on the left that, uh, um, I would say, we, you have a clear advantage for what is concerned the flux of the source only in the far infrared of terahertz regime for infrared synchrotron emission. Why in the mid infrared and near infrared regime? I would say black body conventional black body sources are more uh, provide more photons with respect to infrared. There is another thing that should be considered when we consider that emission from a bending magnet of infrared light. 
We have also to take into account another parameter that is the natural divergence of our source, that is defined as the angular range to which 90% of the emitted photons travel. So, as you can see, this, uh, this uh, divergence is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the radius of your re bending magnet. If you try to fit in this formula parameters of electron, for example, as in the table be, uh, below, you can see that the natural divergence is really increasing very fast, increasing the wavelength. So that means that going from the near infrared to the far infrared, your vertical angle acceptance angle should be very large. So it, it, moves, it moves from 9 millirads to 90 millirads. So, summarizing, if we want to build up an infrared beam line and to have enough flux, uh, we need to maximize the horizontal extraction angle for our bending magnet, but we need also to maximize the vertical extraction angle in order to cover the larger infrared ra range as possible. Consequently, I would say that, that, that's, uh, that, that's the main constraints. However, uh, there is also, <coughs> sorry, uh, there is a, this is a, an example also of how ring energy and the radius of the ring can in change or can modulate the vertical <coughs> extraction, the, the divergence of the beam. And as you see, this is much larger for smaller rings with respect to larger ones. There is, however, another type of source of infrared synchrotron radiation and synchrotron facility, that is, that is the so-called edge radiation. Edge radiation is produced when electrons experience a change in a magnetic field, basically entering or exiting a bending magnet. So at the end of our beam line, we can collect bending magnet, but also edge radiation. This radiation has a very special shape. It is it, is a, it has an, a ring structures characterized by an interference pattern and it is radially polarized. So, it is in, intrinsically brighter with respect to bending magnet emission, as you can, you can see by the progression of these slides. <coughs> And nowadays, it is used in, in the last generation infrared synchrotron radiation beam line. And most of the times, bending magnet emission and infrared emission, they are split in order to serve two different branches. So, the point is, we understood that the, 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 the photon flux is not very high for infrared synchrotron radiation, but what's the advantage, what's the reason for building up beam lines in infrared synchrotron radiation, in the synchrotron radiation facility? The advantage is the one that is obtained by the brightness. So, synchrotron, infrared synchrotron radiation, due to the collimation properties of the emission, is much brighter with respect to conventional infrared sources, and the advantage can be estimated in, in order of 1,000, 100, 1,000. So, overall, we can exploit infrared, the following synchrotron radiation, infrared synchrotron radiation advantages. So, we have a flux advantage in the far infrared and terahertz regime, so that can be exploited for, for far infrared and terahertz spectroscopy in order to uh, fasten the data collection and uh, collecting spectra with a better, higher signal to noise ratio. We can exploit the broadband nature of infrared synchrotron radiation. This is, can be exploited for both spectroscopy and microscopy because we do not need to change our source for going from the near infrared to the mid infrared. And we can take advantage from the, bright, from the brightness, especially for microscopy, in order also in this case to fasten data collection and improve signal to noise ratio of our spectra. I want also to mention that polarization of, uh, of the infrared light is polarized from synchrotron radiation and <clears throat> we have linear polarization in case of bending magnets and the circular polarization for edge radiation. So in case of polarized measurement you can exploit, it's possible to exploit the natural polarization of infrared light. This is done in a special beam lines, dedicated beam lines in some uh, synchrotron facility worldwide. So, this is uh, one picture of the CC beamline that is the synchrotron infrared source for 
spectroscopy and imaging here in Electrosynchrotron at Trieste. And in this image, you can see uh, also the red part of in this red part, you have uh, the, 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 end, the final part of the beamline, and here you can see the instrumentation that is basically made by a Fourier transform interferometer coupled with, infra with an infrared microscope. Infrared microscopes are uh, basically special design microscopes made by totally reflective optics that can uh, be exploited to focus infrared light and visible light at the same point. Especially in, in particular, we use cast grain or so-called also Schwarzschmidt objectives that are achromatic optics that are particularly useful when you want to scan or to probe your sample with a polychromatic source. So, what I want to stress in this slide is the following. So the design of such a kind of microscopes is the design of microscopes that work in the far field regime. So in the far field regime, uh, the Rayleigh criterion is um, determining the uh, lateral resolution that can be achieved, that is basically diffraction limited. So, accordingly to the wavelength and to the standard numerical apertures of a cast grain objectives that you can find for the infrared, uh, we can safely admit that the synchrotron, the um, re lateral resolution that can be achieved by using those microscopes is in the range of the microns. However, this is a theoretical limit that um, can be obtained only using synchrotron radiation. Here you can see, which is the level of the signal-to-noise ratio that has been obtained acquiring spectra with a synchrotron radiation source on the right or, or a conventional source on the left at increasing lateral resolution. As you can see, basically, you can see from 10 by 10 and, and, and the smaller aperture that the synchrotron advantage is huge with respect to conventional sources because the level of noise of your spectra is much, much lower and consequently we can conclude that the theoretical diffraction limit that, um, of infrared uh, radiation uh, microscopy in far field regime can be achieved only with synchrotron radiation. And this is the reason because most of the experiments, especially um, for biological application, they require uh, Fourier transform infrared microspectroscopy with synchrotron radiation. So, why, what is infrared biospectroscopy? Biospectroscopy in general is the spectroscopy of the molecule of life. So the molecule of life are basically macromolecules most of the time, constituted by mostly carbon atoms, but also oxygen, nitrogen, and other atoms. And they are the constituents of our cells, tissue, organs, up to living beings. They are proteins, they are lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. And these are the most important macromolecules that uh, people want to study when they are interested in the biochemical you know, composition of um, tissues, for example, of cell or cells. The samples that can be studied so with infrared, so can be Sample, conventional samples like solutions, for example, of proteins, of lipids, but they can be also entire cells of piece of tissues, with the advantage that using microscopy we can focus having an heterogeneous sample, we can focus on the specific region of the samples and correlate the sample morphology with the sample chemistry. So, what you can, we can understand from an infrared spectrum um, of a complex system, uh, like for example a cell, a cell, a biological cell, a mammalian cell. So the, same, the spectrum is very easy, but we can recognize in each different spectral region that are characteristics for the macromolecules that constitute the sample. So lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. And we can get information on several aspects of this macromolecule. For example, we can get information on the protein conformation. We can get, we can get information on the composition of the cell membrane, on the fluidity of these membranes. You can obtain information on the DNA and the RNA content, for example, on, on the folding 
depending on the state unfolding of these nucleic acids. But we can also obtain information for what is concerning the carbohydrate content of our system to understand how, to say, how much it is active or not active this cell. So on this basis, is built up uh, by spectroscopy for complex systems like mammalian cells and tissues. The first example that uh, um, I want to show you is based uh, on a standard application of Fourier transform infrared microspectroscopy with synchrotron radiation that has been used for the study of, of the radiation damage induced by, by soft X rays. So, this experiment has been produced uh, or has been uh, done in collaboration with, with the TwinMIC beamline at Electra. TwinMIC is a beam, soft X rays beamline that uh, operates, I would say, as a X ray microscope in order to get morphological information on your sample, but it can also operate for performance low energy X ray fluorescence analysis. So, in order to localize <coughs> through fluorescence, I would say, uh, the chemical or identify the elemental composition of the sample. These are just images that represent the distribution of some elements in with grains. However, we have to consider that nowadays the scientists, they uh, go to push and push the lateral resolution. So they want to uh, resolve uh, smaller and smaller details. So for those kind, uh, in order to achieve this goal, um, nowadays the technology is ready. So means that we need focusing optics that are able to focus our X-rays, for example, in very narrow and very nanometer spots. However, there is another thing to be considered that is from the perspective of the sample. So, which is the sample damage? Because if we need to squeeze our photon in smaller and smaller spots, we also greatly increase the dose of photons that is delivered to our sample. So, this problem is especially uh, I would say severe in the soft X-ray regime. Why? Because it is exactly in the soft X-ray regime that lighter atoms like carbon, nitro nitrogen and oxygen, that are the larger constituents of biomatter, they have the, the absorption. So basically <clears throat> they are more sensitive, biological samples, to soft X-rays with respect maybe to hard X-rays. What we know today about soft X-ray radiation damage if you do a literal sur survey, you know, for example, you can understand easily that the radiation damage is dose dependent, not surprising. You can understand that the radiation damage depends on sample preparation. And for example, hydrated samples undergo more relevant changes with respect to fixed samples when exposed to X-rays. Why? Because most of the radiation damage is mediated by water. So basically, it's water that produces radical and radical start to break, I would say, the macromolecular chains. And in order to prevent or try to limit such a kind of damage, most of, uh, of the bio experiments are done by using cryopreservation techniques. You can know the genetic material is extremely sens sensitive to ionizing radiation, and even that the radiolytic effects undergoing by specific molecules strongly depend on the sample architecture. So basically, each individual molecule reacts differently. Um, with the, when exposed to X-rays uh, with respect to the others. So there is, a very, there is an individual susceptibility to, the, to the do, deliver the dose. However, all this kind of information has been obtained by using as probing source X-rays. So that means the same source that is inducing the damage. So, with our colleagues of the TwinMIC beamline, we decided to design a different experiment where the X-rays has been used not only uh, for trying to understand the damage, but uh, I would say to expose at different doses uh, the samples that of our interest, that in this case were cells, human embryonic kindling cells, fixed in paraformaldehyde, and then measured um, with different techniques. X-ray 
techniques a twin mic beam line that uh, is for doing x-ray images or obtaining X-ray fluorescence, but we use in parallel two other techniques for understanding, I would say, the effects of X-ray, increasing X-ray doses that are atomic force microscopy and infrared uh, microscopy, that both of them are not damaging. So, uh, in the experiment, we work like this. So basically, we uh, prepared our cell. The cell has been first measurement by, measured by infrared and atomic force microscopy at step zero. They, they have been uh, just kept under vacuum for a while and then measured again by atomic force microscopy and infrared and then exposed to low, medium and high X-ray doses and again exposed after each step um, measured with infrared and atomic force microscopy. So technique by technique, which are the outcomes that we obtain. So, atomic force microscopy first. We observed a minimal cell shrinkage. That means that the shape of the cells is quite well preserved. It's a consequence of the exposure, also for the higher doses. We just noticed a thinning of the pseudopodia termination of the cells. We observe um, topographical changes. That, mean, that means that we observe a roughness increase on the of the cell surface with the appearance of nanometric pit pits and bulges um, <clears throat> that increase in size and number accordingly with exposure dose. But what we noticed also was an appreci appreciable thickness variation especially on the nuclear region at step four, so for the higher exposure dose. That's interesting to notice that um, what we noticed was an increase on the thickness of the cell and not a decrease. So that is very strange because most of the time in, in the papers that has been reported in the literature, people, they talk about muscle loss as a consequence of X-ray exposure. However, what is this muscle loss? Actually, they improperly use the term mass because simply considering the progression of X-ray microscopy images, what you can try to uh, get, the information that you can get, is uh, a variation uh, of the density of your uh, sample uh, normalized on the sample thickness. So, what you can understand measuring uh, the absorbed light and postulating a mass absorption coefficient for your biological sample, you can measure what we call mass thickness. And actually, it's not the mass that change in time, but it's the mass thickness that decreases with increasing dose. So, what is changing density of thickness of in which relation? In order to answer this question, actually we exploited the information that we could obtain by atomic force microscopy and we, I would say, normalize our X-ray microscopy images with respect to the thickness that has been measured by the, the uh, morpho sensitive, morphologically sensitive technique like a, a, AFM. And actually, indeed, we could demonstrate that what is changing is in, the, it's in reality the cell density and not really the cell mass. However, the most in, more interesting results comes from infrared. So here you can see the plots. So at the bottom of this slide, you see the, the a typical spectrum of the nuclear region of one cell, that is in this case, this one. And we consider three different regions, diagnostic for lipids, diagnostic for proteins, and diagnostic for um, nucleic acids. And what we did, we simply integrate, I would say, the band characteristics of these macromolecules, and we consider their variation as a function of the exposure dose. As you can see, if you consider all these macromolecules, what happens is that the intensity of the bands decrease and decrease up to basically disappearing for the higher exposure dose. But indeed, what does it mean? Because our cell is still there, the shape doesn't change so much. So, if you have a look to the sample progression, actually what you can see is that the intensity of the bands progressively decrease and they become broader and broader up to the last step 
for the higher exposure dose where basically your system is not more an absorbing system but is just a nucleus with a shape with a with a size comparable uh, to the wavelength that is probing it in that moment and so basically it becomes just a body that scatter light and not absorb more light so our results means that the cell, the matter is basically is still there, but there are no more the covalent bonds that link much, that link atoms one to the other. So increasing the dose, the vibrational network of the covalent network of our molecules that produce vibration is totally, totally destroyed. So this means that we cannot really talk more about biochemistry of our sample. You can do even more details and you can study more in detail the progression as a function of, of the exposure dose. And the very interesting thing that pop up is actually this result that we, you see that there is a certain order in the progression of the fragmentation or in the progression of the breaking of the bonds. Because uh, independently, if you consider a protein, a nucleic acid, or lipids, what breaks first are the uh, macromolecular, I would say, blocks. So basically, polymers become start to become monomers. So peptide backbone is, for example, first breaking for proteins, or phosphate backbone is first breaking in, in, in uh, nucleic acids. And only in a second stage, the monomers fragment in small molecules. Those small molecules, in our opinion, tend to escape fr from uh, from the cell body and this implies they increase I would say in the volume because it's a sort of swelling due to those molecules that try to small molecules that are volatile and try to escape the, the cytoskeleton so this is the conclusion of this work that we are continuing in this moment trying to to perform the same experiments in hydrated condition that is not trivial for both infrared but especially for in vacuum techniques but the message should be that when you we measure a biological sample with very high doses so that means increasing the lateral resolution of our experiments we sh we need always to take care on the damage that we are inducing. That's a fundamental, uh, even for the future of uh, um, the facilities. So I want to briefly conclude my presentation providing you new perspectives for uh, infrared spectroscopy and microscopy and especially I want to talk to you about the vibrational spectroscopy and the nanoscale. So as I told you uh, we can use infrared spectroscopy, we can have infrared microscopy with uh, diffraction limited lateral resolution in the mi micrometer regime. But nowadays, <coughs> as we develop a technology that is able to uh, provide or to give to us e vibrational information on the samples with a nanometer lateral resolution. And then it is what we call infrared nanoscopy. In our opinion, infrared nanoscopy that continues to be a not damaging vibroelectronic characterization techniques is, um, I would say, the very, uh, very important advance in technology uh, because uh, um, those kind of, of techniques can really achieve the same lateral resolution that is provided by X-rays. So making uh, infrared microscopy at a nanometer scale fully compatible and fully complementary with nanoscale techniques based on X-rays or even on electrons. So making a long story very short, uh, I can just mention to you that there are uh, two types of approaches, approaches that can allow you to uh, collect infrared spectra at the nanometer scale. The first one is called scattering type scanning near field infrared microscopy or scattering SNIM. Basically, it is based on, on, on a, a machine that it seems to be apparently an atomic force microscope because you exploit a metallic tip. The tip is, is shine with an infrared light and it acts as an antenna. And then you have the concentration of the electric film orthogonal or perpendicular to the sample that is beneath your antenna or your tip. So 
the, uh, what you measure in this case uh, is the perturbation of this field due to the presence of the sample. So you measure a scattered light. The scattered light is basically proportional to the intensity of the incoming electric radiation on a electric field through a polar polarizability coefficient. So the, this polarizab effective polarizability coefficient is depends from several parameters. For example, on the electric constant of the medium, polarizability of the tip, <coughs> radius of the tip, distance of the tip from the sample, and mm, <coughs> on the optical properties of your sample. So if you can basically model or know all the parameters, the only parameter that is unknown is basically the electric constants, the, the electric constant on the sample. Therefore, by treating the signal in a proper way, you can really obtain information of both a really an imaginary part of the refractive index of your system. This is an approach in order to obtain such a kind of non-resolved information because the lateral resolution that we achieve is basically on the same range of the tip radius, so means a few tens of nanometer or even less. There is another type of approach that can be used for obtaining information in the nanoscale um, that in that case provided to you just the imaginary part of the refractive index. It is based again on, on a sort of instrument that exploit atomic force microscopy setup. In this case, your sample is shined with infrared light. Infrared light is absorbed. Absorption of infrared light produces sample deformation. Sample deformation uh, produces a uh, oscillation, I would say, of, of a, a band of oscillation of your cantilever. And then if you measure the ring down, so how your cantilever is modulating um, the vibration, you can obtain information, direct information on the so light absorbed by the sample. In this case, the lateral resolution is slightly lower because it depends also on diffusivity properties of your sample, but again is in the range of tens of nanometers. Nowadays, there are instruments that can join all the possibilities together and they open really larger perspective, new perspective in spectroscopy, biospectroscopy, material science and many other fields. So, why and where, where and why uh, nanoscopy in synchrotron radiation facilities? So, um, there are uh, programs that has been developed, already developed in some synchrotrons in order to implement infrared beam light with the nano, in infrared nano, nano end stations. Uh, the first one was the one in uh, Germany and the PTB uh, uh, ring that is actually not a user dedicated ring but is for metrology purposes. And uh, the I would say that the, the, and the first beam lines open to the user were at the advanced light source in Berkeley and in Brazil. And there are other projects that are ongoing uh, in uh, Asi Asiatic synchrotrons. Soleil Diamond is also recently open to user is a nano station and Soleil is still in the commissioning phase. And coming soon, <coughs> this end station on this uh, <coughs> station will be also in the lecture. Thanks to the joint effort, the scientific and economically joint effort of Electra, NFFA, and YOM CNR. So we are glad to, to welcome new users and new projects on this uh, uh, new type of technology. Why? Why in synchrotron facility? I would say commercial machines, they are based on lasers. However, lasers are beautiful, they are very powerful, but they have a very big disadvantages. They are very narrow in emission. So, as I told you several times, especially for biospectroscopy, you need to span a very, very large spectral range in order to get the entire information on your sample. So you need an ultra broadband nature and synchrotron is intrinsically an ultra broadband source. It's also true that, I would say, it's true that Lasers are very powerful, but the density of power provided by synchrotron is comparable or even sometimes superior with the one provided by several lasers. And especially such a kind of source like synchrotron sources, infrared synchrotron sources are very much more, are much more stable with respect to the laser and the actual technology. So um, 
I would say power is not everything. Sometimes power can be also damaging, as I show you. And what is making really the difference in spectroscopy is not only signal, but it's the signal to noise ratio. So this is the reason why in synchrotron radiation facilities we are now people are now working hardly in order to implement beam lines toward the use of infrared nanoscopy. So basically what we can do or what we will be able to do is to move from micro scale to the nano scale. That means to move from studying uh, I would say tissue of cells to the study of proteins, aggregates of proteins, like for example fibrillar formation or proteins in membranes or even single proteins. We can move from studying cell communities to individual cells, for example like in bacteria or uh, in, uh, for in bacteria of biofilms. But we can also really open new perspectives for chemistry and smart materials, for example common polymers, copolymers, uh, heteropolymers, and all the such archive on organic matter that is heterogeneous at the nanoscale. Okay. I hope that uh, you had now new ideas for your studies and uh, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. <music>